Okay. So, um, if someone ha is suffering from any of those problems yes. that you mentioned, their anxiety, loneliness, uh, uh, ego, whatever, um, all those things that you mentioned, um, the exercises that you give, from where did you get those exercises? I got them from 30, uh, 40 years studying psychology and Hasidism. And is it also from your own personal interactions yeah. with people? Abs abs oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, but I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I got it from Professor so and so. No, no, I understand. You know, I got it from my teachers right. and my, my peers and my friends and. And, and 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 like you say, you know, from things that I've been experiencing yeah. and dealing with for the last forty years. So, it's more like the 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 accumulation of spiritual wisdom, and applied to your daily life. Yes, mm -hmm. that's that's well said. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like a great book. I'd like to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it it's not what I call a couch potato reading book. <laughs> no. It's not like you know, eat a self, a, a, right. you know. This is food for thought. You have to think about it, and you have to let it seep in. Right. You know. Yeah. So there are lessons, and there are exercises, and that's important. Do you need a? Go ahead. Copy? Do you have it on? Yeah. Go ahead. Do you need a copy of Tanya to to make use of it? See that. Do, do you need? Do you have to have a copy of Tanya to refer to? No, no. I've, I've written it in English. Okay. You know. <laughs> you know. If someone wants to kind of, that's what I'm saying. No, the answer is no because she, as a student, you know, who, who learned Tanya or I, as a student in yeshiva, you're not going to find these words there. You're just not going to. Okay, most of it. Maybe maybe ego you will, but you're not going to find schizophrenia. You're not going to find hypocrisy. You know, hmm. you know, you're not going to find loneliness. Friendliness, love, fear, guilt, honesty. In between the lines, you will, and that's what I did. You know. And by the way, this is this is just, you know, someone else can come along and write a similar book and have a different set of uh, topics and ideas. It, it's very, you know. But this is what I thought is very important today for many people. Not just for one, one area, you know, people who are just suffering from having, you know, difficulty with anxiety, depression. You see, when you learn in yeshiva or in a girls' school, Tanya, you know, they, from chapters 26 to 34, they talk about the depression, depression, depression. You know, first of all, we're not talking about clinical depression. <laughs> we're talking about a psychological depression. For clinical depression, if you need medicine, a psychiatrist will suggest it and you should be taking it, you know, if, if you need it, okay? Tanya is not a substitute for pills, if need be, if need be. At the same time, when you study it, you could slowly wean yourself off some of that, okay? Then that's, uh, that has to be done with a professional, there's no... I want to make it very clear, and you know, I'm sure the carp deals with these things daily. You know, it's not the, the, no, any rabbi that tells you that uh, you, you know, the, you know, get off the pills, don't listen to your psychiatrist, and then your social worker and psychologist. Uh, I don't know. You know, they're taking a big responsibility. At the same time, there are ideas here that could help. It's like you said before, spiritually for sure. You know. And when you become, and this I want to go back to the, uh, the opening thought, the idea of light. When you become, you feel better about yourself. The Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, has many letters about mental health. I know this because I wrote another book called The Rebbe's Advice. It's a 400, it's a 300 page book. It covers thousands and thousands of his letters. I took out the excerpts, ex excerpted those parts that are practical. In that book, I covered all issues from business to, to health, to marriage, to 
to spirituality, right? So in that book, I have a, you know, a section that deals with mental health issues from, based on the Rebbe's letters. And the Rebbe suggests to a person who had depression, clinical depression, couldn't get themselves out, the Rebbe suggests to have other people help them get out yeah. and try to volunteer in, in to volunteer. Now, you might say, like, you know, okay, that's 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 simple. It might be simple, but to do it for someone who's who's has depression, it's it's a very difficult thing. Okay. So we need we need to help people feel better about themselves. One of the ways is we have someone, of course, my wife, and you know, uh, he's talking always about Mashiach, the Jewish Messiah, the Mashiach. Not a Chabad person, actually oriented in the Lithuanian philosophy and teachings, but really. That's one thing she talks a lot about in Lush and Hara, gossip. And she uh, she attacks my wife, you know, because of her mental mm -hmm. situation. She's my wife doesn't blink an eye. She's I wish she would be here. I couldn't do it. I can, I couldn't I can't do it. As much as I write, as much as I talk, I'm better. You know, but she's natural, and she just listens and listens and takes the abuse and says, "Okay, go ahead." You know, that makes that person feel better. That makes them feel better. So, the 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 idea of of being tolerant and being a listening ear, you know. That's a very helpful thing. And the more you do that, the greater the mitzvah. I know someone who, in Florida, who started, uh, became friendly with him. He's not, not you know, in Chabad we say, not yet <laughs> observant. <laughs> Comes from New Jersey, you know, conserve the docks, reform home, something like that, whatever. Very, you know, he likes Chabad and he, and he is very involved in the programs. And um, I connected him with someone who is very bright, knows a lot of Torah, but he has, you know, some serious depression out in Florida. So I had this person, I paired him up with this other person, younger man, and the best of friends now. He schleps out to him and gets him out to go to what we call a fabring and a gathering because he wouldn't go on his own. Wow. And he loves it. Once he's out, he loves it. He, yeah. And, and, but if not for this person taking the time. And I don't, you know, I, I told him about this a year or two weeks ago. Now he's writing to me. He says to me, Rabbi, he says, Rabbi I went with so-and-so here. I went with so-and-so here. He enjoys doing it. He sees. I said, more than anything you're doing by bringing some more happiness to this person is the greatest thing. You're putting on filling in the morning, excellent, important. But what you're doing to help a, a, a person who's, who's hurting, who doesn't want to be that way, doesn't want to be that way. Who wants to be hurt? No one. But just can't get out. And you go and pick him up. And he lives four, three, four blocks from the shul, small blocks. Wow. He just can't get himself out. But when my friend comes, he goes into the car or they walk, whatever, and he comes. Yeah. So we need to, we need to, you know, to take them by the hand. Just got to take them by the hand. And it's a lot of work. And that's, I assume, uh, the carpet's part of your organization. 
you know, to to get more volunteers to do to help other people, you know. And in this way, you pick them up, you go out to a park, you go out, you know, uh, doesn't have to be every day. It can't be every day. It's too much. Once a week, once every two weeks. There's so much we can do. There's so much we can do. And, and, and we need to do it. You're a builder. You take someone out, you show them how you build houses. You're building anyway. Or, you, you know what I'm saying? That's true. You would take their mind off. Take my mind off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All, yeah, all troubles. No, but that 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 divert the thought. Right. So before we spoke about it by speaking it out. Yeah. Now we're talking about through some action, right. some behavior, right? Yeah. Behavior is take out older people. My my daughter was fin the, the younger daughter was graduating now and uh, she's finishing the social work. She's a dime uh, a dementia specialist. Mm. She loves senior citizens. And she was a program director in one of these homes in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. And I've seen her, I've seen her in action. I, I'm blown away, you know. I, I didn't teach her this. She self-taught and she she did had three years of experience with you know elderly people in in a nursing home in a that facility. And now she's able to do certain games that she plays with the older people and brings more happiness to her. One of the other things that I do is oral history. Mm. In fact, I'm doing oral history now with Rabbi Kalmanson, a senior cop Rabbi Kalmanson here in, right around the corner. Mm. A person has a whole life when you get to your 60s, especially your 70s, yeah. surely 80s. Unfortunately, many people they want to tell the story, but they tell us when it's really late, where you're already not so well, and you start forgetting. Give me a second, please. No it was called oral family history. Right. And I'm, I'm in the middle of, um, that's what I'm doing this week. Part of what I'm doing is uh, doing these. Uh, I'm at the seminary. The reason I'm here, I'd rather come and tell you, and I didn't tell you. The uh, archives, the American Jewish archives at HUC invited oh. me here to research. Oh. So once I'm here, so I knew Rabbi Kalmanson is here, and he has a lot of information for all the years that he's been here and, and other places. So I'm getting it, I can't say all out of him, but a lot out of him, right? And um, next week I'll be down in Buffalo doing another rabbi, Rabbi Greenberg. You might know him, Herschel Greenberg. Out of Buffalo, and we'll be doing a few days of oral history there. Why am I telling you this? Older people have what to say, and if you have the right interviewer, they will talk, and you'll feel so good, so good. Someone listens to them, and I record it. It's for the family, by the way. It's, it's not for the public, you know. It's for the family. I'm commissioned by the family. But the point is that with older people. Doing these type of things is great. My father who loves to talk, <laughs> God bless him, and he can talk for hours. He's very energetic at 87. He becomes 87, God willing, in a few weeks. And uh, I wrote his biography, you know, the surviving Holocaust, uh, Romanian Holocaust per Jew, my father. And he loves talking about, and he remembers. Oh, wow, he remembers details of childhood. Remembers, remembers details of Romania, details of, of Israel in the 1950s, the 60s in Brooklyn, how he worked two jobs in the, uh, in the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard or those places with uh, mice, and, mice and other things of, right around his head at night because no one else was around and he had to make, put the cones on the machines to, uh, to make the sweaters. That was his first job. And then he became a taxi driver, and he remembers this and that. Fascinating. But he has someone to speak to. My mother passed on, you know, 16 years ago. Of course, he's lonely. It's hard. So we call him. We try to go over. But, you know, so, so, so the more you could do for others in this vein, to take them out, to talk with them... <clears throat> You bring a lot of happiness, a lot of happiness to them. Oh.